all good many of you have heard or have read articles written about the inception of AA. There are probably some who haven't. And from that brief story, there are some things to be learned. So, even at risk of repetition, I would like to relate just exactly what did happen in those uh, very early days. And I feel there is a lesson to be learned and one that we must never forget if we wish to maintain paid up insurance policies against our drinking. You recall the story about Bill having uh, been, uh, having had some spiritual experience, having been uh, sold on the idea of attempting to be helpful to others. You undoubtedly recall the fact that he had been working quite hard at it for around five months or so, almost incessantly, and still had not created, if you please, a single convert. Not one. As we express it, no one had jailed. But he had worked tirelessly uh, with no thought of saving his own strength or time or anything. But uh, nothing seemed to register. When he came out to act on this business mission, which perhaps for the good of all of us turned out to be quite a flop, although he had the thing licked but didn't know it, he was tempted to drink, and he was pacing up and down the lobby of the Mayflower Hotel, wondering whether he better buy those two fists of gin uh, and be a king for a night, as he expresses it, or not. And his teachings led him to believe that he possibly might avoid getting into difficulties if he found some alcoholic on whom to work. And spying the name of our good friend, Reverend Walters, on the <coughs> bulletin board in the lobby of the Mayflower, he called up the good doctor and uh, asked him the names of some of the group of people with whom he had been affiliated and through whose, through whose instrumentality he, he had acquired uh, sobriety. The good doctor said he wasn't one, but he knew of quite a number, and he gave him quite a little list, I guess about nine or ten of them. So Bill starts to call them up without very much success. They were, had either they were just left town or they were just leaving town or they were having a party or they had a sore toe or something. Anyway, they came down to the end or at least very nearly the end and his eye lights on the name Mrs. and happened to get our good friend Henrietta. But he called up a good Henry and told her what he wanted, and she said, come right out and have luncheon. So out he went and went into his story in considerable detail, and she said, I have just a man for you. So she rushes to the phone and calls up Anne and tells her that she has just a fellow to be helpful to Bob, and we should come over. And he said, well, I guess we better not go over today. But Henry is very persistent, very determined individual. He said, oh, yes, come on over. Uh, I know it'll be helpful to Bob. Well, Henry didn't think it was quite wise for us to come over today. And finally, Henry bore in to such an extent that she had to tell her that I was very much in the sack. And uh, has, in fact, surpassed all <laughs> capabilities for listening to any conversation. 
and it would just possibly have to be postponed. So she stopped in the next day, having invited being Sunday and Mother's Day, and we said that uh, Ann said we would be over. Well, I don't ever remember her feeling much worse, but being very fond of Henry and having said we'd go over, we started over, and I extracted this solemn promise man on the way over that 15 minutes of this stuff was tough, that I didn't want to talk to this mug or anybody else, and we'd really make it snappy. Now, these are actual facts. Uh, we got there at 5 o'clock, and it was 11.15 when we left. Now, you know, uh, or possibly your memories are good enough to carry you back to certain times when you haven't felt too good, and you can easily visualize the fact that you wouldn't have listened to anybody unless that individual had really had something to tell you. And that's the way I felt about Bill. And I recognized the fact that he did have something, and so I listened those um, many hours. And uh, I stopped drinking immediately. But very shortly after that, there was a medical meeting in uh, Atlantic City. And I de uh, developed a terrific thirst for knowledge. I had to have knowledge. So we would go to, I would go to Atlantic City and absorb lots of knowledge. I usually mention the fact that I incidentally had acquired a thirst for, for scotch, but I didn't mention that. But anyway, I went to Atlantic City and really hung one on. And uh, when I was came to, I was in the home of a friend of ours in Targa Falls, one of our suburbs, and Bill came over and got me, and uh, got me home, uh, gave me a hooker or two of scotch that night, and a bottle of beer the next morning, and uh, that was on the 10th of June of 35, and I have had no alcohol in any form that I know of since. Now... The, the uh, interesting part of all this, and not all these sordid details, but the uh, uh, condition that we two fellows were in, we had both been associated with the same uh, bunch of uh, people. He in New York and I in Akron. I had been associated with them, in fact, for two years and a half. He for five months. He had acquired this idea of service, and uh, that I had not. But I had uh, done an immense amount of reading, which they recommended. I had refreshed my memory on the good book, and I'd had an excellent training in that as a youngster. They told me that I should go to their meetings regularly, and I did every week. They said I should uh, affiliate myself with some church, and we did that. And they also said that I should cultivate the habit of prayer. And I did that, at least to quite a considerable extent for me. Uh, but I got tight every night. And I mean that. Uh, it's once in a while, which is practically every night, uh, and I couldn't understand what was wrong. I had done all these things that these good people told me to do, every one of them, and I thought very faithfully and sincerely, but I still continued to overindulge. But the one thing that they hadn't told me was the one thing that Bill had. The uh, instruction to attempt to be helpful to somebody else. So we immediately started to look around for prospects, and it wasn't long before one appeared in the form of a man whom you all know, at least a great many of you know, a good friend of Akron. Now, I knew that this uh, Bill was a uh, Sunday school superintendent. 
And I also thought that he probably forgot more about the good book every night than I ever knew. And he, uh, who was I to be trying to tell him about it? And so uh, made me feel somewhat uh, hypocritical. It is quite a job for me to talk to him uh, on that sort of subject. But anyway, we both did, and I'm very glad to say the conversation fell on fertile ground. Then in October, we had three dumped in our lap uh, almost simultaneously. But the point I wanted to bring out was the fact that uh, that in my mind, the spirit of service is of prime importance, although it has to be backed up with some uh, knowledge of uh, the subject. I know I used to go to the hospital, and I'd stand there and, and talk. I talked many a time to a chap in the bed for four or five or six hours. I don't know how he ever stood me for five or six hours, but he did. Probably we'd hidden his clothes or something. But anyway, uh, the, it came to my mind that uh, I probably didn't know too much about what I was talking. Therefore, we being the stewards of what we have, and that includes our time, I was not giving a good account of my stewardship of time. If it took me six hours to say something to this man that I could have said in an hour, I will say, if I'd known what I was talking about, I certainly was not a very efficient individual. And incidentally, I'm somewhat allergic to work anyway. So, uh, I felt that I should uh, continue to increase my familiarity not only with the good book, but uh, read a good deal of good standard literature and possibly something of uh, scientific interest along with it. So I did tolerate this habit of reading, and I think, I've, I think I'm not exaggerating when I say that I have probably averaged to read an hour a day for the last 15 years. Now, I don't say that to try to sell you on the idea that you've got to cultivate that habit of reading an hour a day, because there are plenty of people and fine AAs that don't read very much. And you see, back in those days, we were groping in the dark entirely. We did not uh, know much about it. We knew practically nothing of alcoholism. I, a physician, knew nothing about it. Because oh, I'd read about it, but there wasn't anything worth reading in any of the textbooks. And uh, usually the information about it consisted on uh, some queer treatment for DTs. If you'd gone that far, and if you hadn't, why, you prescribed a few bromides and uh, gave the fellow a good lecture. None of which, of course, uh, amounted very much. And in early uh, AA days, we became quite convinced that uh, the spiritual program was fine, but it, uh, we could help the Lord out a little with some supplementary diet. So, uh, in the early days, Bill, having a lot of stomach trouble, had stumbled across the fact that uh, he got along much better on sauerkraut and cold tomatoes. And so we thought that in as much as Bill had to have that experience, that probably everyone else would share the same. But of course we discovered later that the uh, most any dietary restriction had very little to do with the acquisition and maintenance of permanent sobriety. We, uh, in our own stories in the mountain things speak of, when I, we started in on Bill, we had no 12 steps, we had no traditions, we had uh, nothing of that kind. But we were 
convinced that the answer to our problem was in the good book. And it uh, became somewhat evident, we thought, to some of our, us older ones that it was contained, the part that we found absolutely essential to a rather limited section of the good book. In other words, the Sermon on the Mount, 13th chapter of Corinthians, and the book of James. I think we got those ideas pretty firmly implanted in our minds very early. And we had in those days, our membership got to five and seven and ten and still small. Why, we used to have daily meetings in somebody's house. Um, it was probably providentially arranged that uh, this, all this happened at a time when everybody was broke. And awfully broke, too. It was probably much easier for us to be successful when broke than it would have been to have been successful if we had uh, a good checking account of peace. But I know that we were, we were, every one of us just so painfully broke that, well, it wasn't a pleasant thought. But nothing could be done about it, and everybody else was broke too, and so we didn't take it too much to heart. But I do think that that was providentially arranged. But anyway, we kept on having these meetings and having these discussions and attending the meetings of the, these good people with whom we had been associated and did continue to have them with them until, in Akron I'm talking about, of course, until about 40, or maybe early in 41. Might have been January 41. I don't recall the exact date. When we outgrew the relevance of this good friend who had allowed us to bang up the plaster and the uh, door jams, uh, counting chairs up and down, and he had a very beautiful home. Uh, we had outgrown that, and so we stepped out and uh, in a short time acquired the rental of the auditorium in the King's School. And we have, we, I mean, I'm talking about uh, group that I attend personally has been there ever since. We attempt to have a good meeting and I think we are usually successful. But it wasn't until the 39 that the uh, teachings and efforts and studies that uh, had been going on were crystallized in the form of the 12 steps. I didn't write the 12 steps. They had nothing to do with the writing of them. I think probably I had something to do with, with uh, them indirectly because after this June 10th episode, Bill came to live at our house and stayed for about, what was it, about three months. And there was hardly a night in that three months that we didn't sit up till two or three o'clock discussing these things. And it'd be hard for me to conceive that something wasn't said as during those nightly discussions around our kitchen table that influenced the actual writing of the 12 steps. It's much more handy to have in that form, of course, we had the ideas uh, pretty much basically, but not in uh, turf and uh, tangible form. We got them, as I said, as a result of our study and effort out of the good book. We must have had them because uh, we have learned from experience that they are very important in maintaining sobriety and we That is the way that things started off in Akron. And uh, as we grew up, of course, uh, we began to get offshoots. 
first one was in Cleveland. And I don't remember the next one, but uh, anyway, they were started in Akron not too long after that. And uh, have been continuing ever since. It is a great source of satisfaction to me to feel that I may have played some part in sticking in my two bits work toward getting this thing started. I like to think that I have done that. Maybe I'm taking too much for granted. I don't know. But I, I feel that I was simply used as God's agent. I feel that I'm no different from any of you fellows, uh, girls, except that I was a little more fortunate that I got this message 13 and a half years ago, and some of you had to wait till a little later. In fact, I got a little peeved that uh, I have my father because he was a little slow on the trigger because I thought I would have been ready to receive it quite a while before he got around to the center. And uh, that used to irritate me no end, but uh, after all, maybe he knows better than I. But I felt sure that I would have been glad to have any thing presented that would have been workable and produce the sobriety which I thought at least that I wanted so badly. I used to even doubt that at times. I, I would go to my good friend Henry and say, Henry, uh, do you think that I want to stop drinking with it? Henry, being very charitable, told that yes, Bob, I'm sure you want to stop. And uh, I would say, well, I can't conceive of any living human who uh, want, really wanted to do something as badly as I think I want to do it, who could be so total a failure. That any, I think I'm just one of, uh, one of these wanto wanto guys. He said, no, Mom, I think you want to. We just haven't found uh, just the way to work it yet. But anyway, that was the way I felt about it. And the fact that my uh, sobriety has been maintained continuously for 13 and a half years it doesn't uh, allow me to think that I'm necessarily any farther away from my next drink than any of you people here. I'm still very human, and I still think that a double of scotch would taste awful good. And if it didn't produce disastrous results, I might do it. I don't know. I really love scotch. But I have no reason to think that the, it would taste any differently. I have no legitimate reason to believe that the results would be any different. They were always the same. They were always the same in that I always wound up back at the dear old eight ball somewhere. And I have no precedent or anything to uh, make it feel legitimate for me to believe that the results today would be any different than they were 14 and 20 and 25 and 30 years ago, and I did the same thing. I just don't want to pay that bill, because that's a big bill. It always was, and I think it would be even larger today. Because of what has gone on in the last 15 years, I'm naturally being a bit out of practice. I don't believe I've really lasted very long, and I'm having an awful nice time. And I just don't want to bump myself off, even though the uh, with the pleasures of the alcohol route. So I'm not going to do it. And I'm never going to do it. As long as I do the things that I'm supposed to do. And I know what those things are. 
So we, if I should ever get tired, I certainly never would have anyone to blame for it. It would be done, perhaps not with malice or forethought, but it certainly would be done with, as a result at least of extreme carelessness and indifference. I said I was quite human. And I get to thinking every once in a while, well, here's this smart guy, he's a fairly smart individual. He's got this little situation right for the tail, proved it, demonstrated it, and had a drink for 15 years. Probably could knock off a couple, and no one would be the wiser. No, I'm telling you, I'm not trying to be funny at all, because those thoughts actually enter my mind. And I know just the minute they do, exactly what has happened. You see, there in Akron, we have the extreme good fortune, as a great many of you people know, of having a very nice hospital set up at St. Thomas Hospital. Was a ward that theoretically accommodates seven, but consists of vacancies that it stretched a little bit, and we usually, she usually has about two or three more parked around somewhere. And I almost invariably I find that I haven't been paying quite so much attention to the boys in the ward as I should. Just to show sure that idea that I could probably, probably polish off a couple enters my mind, I think, uh-uh, about the boys in the war. You've been giving them the semi-brush off here for a few days. You better get back on the job, big boy, before you get into trouble. And I've had her right back and uh, uh, am much more attentive than I had been in the days preceding the time that I got this funny idea. But I get it, and I get it every once in a while, and I'll probably continue to get it as long <coughs> or whenever I get careless about that one thing. You know, back in uh, those early days about which I spoke, before we had the 12 steps, we did have some other things besides the actual uh, the biblical uh, book boys. I was getting to thinking more of Smith than I was the ward, otherwise I wouldn't have neglected him. And I wasn't being especially loving. When these fellows had come there, indicating their desire for help, and I was just a little too busy to give them any, or at least very much of my time. So I ought to be bothered with the bird. Ten cents to get rid of him, well, that's easy. You could even stand two bits. But not because you love the power, but to, to be relieved of uh, the nuisance of his uh, hanging on your coat sleeve or what have you. No unselfishness, no uh, love indicated in the transaction at all. But I think that the thing that really counts is really giving a service of yourself, and that almost invariably, not always, but almost invariably uh, requires some effort and some time of your own. Putting a little quiet money in the dish, that helps, and possibly that's indicated too. But that isn't giving much, that is for the average individual in days like this when most people get along at least fairly well. That type of giving I don't believe would ever keep anyone sober or anywhere near it. But giving of his own effort and strength and time is quite a different matter. And I think that's what is meant by, and what was meant by what 
bill uh, in New York that I didn't get in Akron. Matter of those four absolute recalling, the only yardsticks we had in the early days, I think they still hold good. And I still think that they can be extremely helpful. I have found at times that questions arise and uh, I want to do the right thing, but the answers are not obvious. Uh, you don't know what the right thing is. But almost always, if you check it into it carefully by the yardstick of absolute honesty, purity, and self and love, and whatever your decision is, checks up pretty well with those four. Your answer can't be very far out of the way. If, however, you do that, as I have done at times, and still am not too satisfied with the answer, I usually consult some friend who is Judgment, perhaps I think in this particular case would be very much better than mine. But usually you can do it yourself without bothering your friends about your own personal decisions uh, in overcoming the first step. You can't quite get honest enough to admit that uh, John Brown really uh, has bested us. Not of absolute purity, uh, uh, somewhat like it, the purity of ideas and purity of motives and what have you. Non-selfishness includes those things that I've just been talking about, not the dime of the two bits to the bump, but actually giving of yourself. And as you all know, the absolute love is probably a big word incorporating all three with a little bit more along with it. I think that that is a very difficult thing to have absolute love. I, I don't think any of us will ever get it. But that doesn't mean that we can't try to get it. It is extremely difficult for me, and I feel that I never have been very successful at it. It's very difficult for me to love my fellow man. I didn't dislike him, but I didn't love him. Uh, unless there was some special reason, he was just, uh, uh, I was just indifferent toward him. I wouldn't do him any harm. I would be willing to give him a little lift if uh, it didn't require too much effort. I never would injure him at all. But to love him, I just couldn't do it for a long time. And I think that I overcame it to some extent when I was forced to do it. Because I was either going to love this said or not to attempt to be helpful to him, or I would probably get comfortable. You could say, well, uh, Lawsy, you were just, uh, that's just a manifestation of selfishness, which is quite correct. I was selfish to the extent of not wanting Smith hurt. So to keep from getting Smith hurt, I, I would attempt to go through the motion of being helpful to this other fellow. You can debate it uh, any way you want to, but uh, the fact still remains for the average individual, absolute love is a thing that he will never acquire. I suspect there are a few people who do. I think maybe I know some that come pretty close to it. But I think I could count them on the fingers of one hand. I don't say that uh, in a disparaging manner, because I have some wonderful friends. I'm talking about it uh, in the uh, finer aspect of 
I don't think we do anything well uh, very much in this world unless we practice it. And I don't believe we do AA work too well unless we practice it. These fellows that win break world records in athletic events, uh, people who, who uh, win their titles in the boxing arena, are people who practice it. They've been practicing it for years. Even though they may uh, necessarily be endowed with a lot of physical ability and uh, uh, skill, they still have to practice. And we have to practice to do a good job in their age. And there are a number of things that we should practice. We should practice as I say, acquiring the spirit of service. We should attempt to acquire some faith, which isn't always easily done, especially for the person who's always been very materialistically minded. And those are the standards of society today beyond all doubt and fair adventure. You have a million bucks, and your neighbor has 900 grand, you're a much better man than your neighbor to the extent of $100,000. And uh, so forth and so on, and nothing. But uh, I think that it can be acquired, it can be acquired slowly. I don't believe, I think that is something that has to be cultivated also. That was not easy for me. I just assume it's difficult for others. Another thing that is difficult for me, and I probably don't do too well yet, and that is the matter of tolerance. Rather in time to have closed minds, they're pretty tightly closed. And that's one reason that some people find uh, our spiritual teachings difficult. They, they, they don't want to find out too much about it for various personal reasons. Uh, one reason is the fear of being considered a permanent, just for illustration. But anyway, the matter of uh, tolerance toward the other individual's ideas, uh, it's quite important that we do acquire it. I think I've acquired it. My, I have much more of it than I did have, although not enough to hurt me any yet. Generally, if somebody crossed me, it's one minute. I would have to make at least a, well, a caustic remark about it, which I've done many times, much to my regret. And later on, I find that the man knew much more about it than I, and I've been infinitely Most of us are not overly blessed, and that is the feeling of humility. I don't mean the humility in the sense of thinking you're a heap at all. I don't mean the doormat variety. I don't think we're necessarily called on to be shoved around and stepped on by anyone, and we have a right to stand up for our right. I'm talking about uh, the attitude of each and every one of us toward our Heavenly Father. Christ said of myself, I am nothing. My strength cometh from my Father in heaven. And if he had to say that, how about you and me? But did you say it? Did I say it? No. That's exactly what we didn't say. We were inclined to say, well, look at us over, boys. Pretty good, huh? 
that type of attitude. But there's no humility, no uh, uh, sense of having received anything through the grace of our Heavenly Father. So if I accomplish something, either in uh, AA activity or uh, socially or in my profession, I don't believe I have any right to get cocky about it. It's only through God's grace that I did it. I can feel very thankful that I was privileged to do it, to have uh, the recognition which uh, I may have received for some activity. But basically, it was only through his kindness. And uh, it's... It, my strength does come from him, and these things come as a result of his kindness. Who am I to get cocky about it? I should have a very, very humble attitude toward the source of my strength. And I should also never cease to be grateful for whatever feelings come my way, uh, uh, blessings come my way. And I have been blessed, and I've been blessed in very large measure. You know, uh, it doesn't make much difference uh, whether a person is drinking or whether they're sober as far as their uh, ultimate aim is concerned. Whether they're drinking liquor or whether they're not, they're still after the same thing, and that's happiness and peace of mind. I hop about that a great deal because that's what we're all after, and we're all after all the time. We want those two things. We want happiness. And we want peace of mind. The trouble with us fellows was that we thought we could demand that the world give us happiness in just the particular way in which we wanted to get it, which happened to be by the alcohol route. And we weren't overly successful. But when we take time to find out and familiarize ourselves with and put into practice some of the spiritual laws which it is necessary to follow to acquire those things, then we find that we get them. And I think I've had them in a uh, very large measure. Those two things, happiness and peace of mind. And I feel most extremely fortunate, and I feel very grateful and thankful that our Heavenly Father has seen fit that I enjoy them. They're there. Anybody can get them who uh, wishes to, but there do seem to be some rules of the game that we have to follow. But they're here and open and free to everyone who uh, wishes to take advantage of them. And by taking advantage of them means their familiarization, their familiarization with them and putting them in practice incorporating them in our own thinking and action, and we're bound and determined to get certain results if we do. As I said, it is a very great source of pleasure and gratitude to me to feel that maybe I kicked in my two bits left toward a starting it. But as I said also, I feel that I was simply used as God's agent. The question might arise, well, we know what A has done in the last 13 years, but how about it from here on? Where do we go from here? Our membership, I think, is conservatively estimated at present around 70,000. But uh, will it be an in increase from here on? Well, that will depend on every member of AA. It is possible for us to do so or not, as we elect. If we fight shy of what the political call entangling alliances, if we avoid getting messed up with controversial issues such as religious and political issues, wet and dry problems, and so forth. If we know 
unity to our central office if we remember the simplicity of our program, if we continue to remember that our job is to get sober and to stay sober and to help our less fortunate brother in doing the same thing, I doubt very much if we shall have any trouble and we shall continue to grow and thrive and prosper. And I hope we all draw those little things in mind. Maybe there should be some additions to the list, but that roughly covers it uh, fairly well. And I hope none of us will ever forget what I just said about helping our less fortunate brother. We'll now give you a little of the uh, first international conference at uh, Cleveland, Ohio, 1950. This was July the 28th to 30th, 1950. And uh, this is where Dr. Bob gave his last talk. And I will one of our co-founders, Dr. Bob.
uh, numerous little kind and thoughtful acts in our behalf. So let us never get the degree of smug complacency so that we're not going to extend or attempt to that help that has been so beneficial to us to our less fortunate brothers. Thank you very much.